All right, guys, we've got a couple of attendees um, on the line. Um, we were kicking off in about 10 minutes or so. Um, I apologize. We uh, ran into a few technical hurdles, so we got about 10 minutes to go as opposed to 15 minutes to go. Um, if anyone wants to chat uh, or ask me any questions while we're waiting to kick off, I'm happy to do so. Let's see who we've got on the call if I know any of you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Wall. I'm going to be your host today. Uh, I'm a CPA based out of Toronto. I've got a background in software development prior to becoming a CPA. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, tech trends today. Um, it's just my two cents on it. Love to hear your thoughts, what you're hoping to hear, what you're hoping to discuss. Uh, if you have any, um, have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. And I will apologize up front. I do have the squeakiest chair in the universe, I believe. While we're waiting, maybe I can just do make sure everyone can hear me all right. How's my sound quality out there? Can I get a thumbs up from people just to make sure my sound is good? Hey, Teresa, how you doing? Thumbs up from April. Thank you guys for confirming the audio is good. Appreciate that. Thank you, Joyce. So um, if anyone does have any questions throughout the webinar or now that they want to chat, feel free to uh, share those. We got about five minutes to go before we kick off now. I am doing today. I'm doing. <laughs> I'm doing today, Teresa. I'm doing great today. How about yourself? Uh, although I must admit, it's uh, we're having a bit of technical issues over here at our site. Our uh, we got a server down, which is never fun. Yes, TO was a great time as always, and we're definitely disappointed you couldn't join us. Hopefully you were able to, to attend uh, virtually through some of the live feeds that we did. Well, hopefully, hopefully I won't disappoint. Um, like I said, I'll just be sharing my sort of two cents on uh, where I think the technology, the big trends for 2019, um, but there's so much technology going on, so many changes right now. It really is an exciting time, I think, for those of us that uh, enjoy technology and finance. FinTech is booming. Um, we've got some amazing apps right out of Canada that are doing some impressive things. So uh, I'm really excited about where we are and where we're positioned and what's, what's going to be coming not only in 2019 but over the next few years. 
And I'm glad you, glad you watched the videos. We got about three more minutes before we'll kick off. Um, so April, I was referring to, um, we did a bunch of live videos when we were down in QB Connect, um, interviews with Jesse He, interviews with Jeff Cates, uh, interviews with attendees. Um, so we've got a bunch of videos up on my Facebook page. Um, so if you just uh, Google Andrew Wall Facebook, um, you should be able to find a whole bunch of stuff right on my main page there. I'll put some of those out on LinkedIn as well. Um, you can find me under LinkedIn slash IN slash small business accountant. And we've got a number of videos there, and we're going to be putting those out over YouTube over the next few weeks in a more edited, more refined format. Um, of course, uh, for those of you who are late night uh, addicts, we also do, I do a um, Friday night live event with Hector Garcia and Michael Lee, uh, where we do these long uh, you know, hour and a half long sessions on Friday nights as we have a, a scotch or a whiskey and just talk about industry stuff. So uh, if anyone's up and around on uh, at 11.30 at night on Friday nights, they're always fun to pop into. Hey, Crystal, how you doing? Another troublemaker was in TO with us. We got about two more minutes. Yeah, uh, it is Eastern time. You are absolutely correct, Teresa. And Brad, yes, it is a riot. And thanks, Brad, for coming in and being on our peanut gallery today. I know, uh, I know you're not able to uh, to stick around for the whole event. I appreciate you popping in while you can. Hey, Jennifer, how you doing? Great, great to have you here. Um, this is the hard part about these sessions. I know, uh, I know so many of you, and I know so many of you are so far along this path that you know as much about this topic as me, if not more. Um, and uh, you know, that's one of the things I point to is I learned so much from our community. Um, a lot of a lot of what I look at as what I see as the industry trends is feedback that I've gotten from people in this community. Oh, Brad, you're here for the full webinar. Awesome, I appreciate that. I know, I know, right now, right now, it's a tough time for you. So thank you for being here to join us. Hopefully, this brings some sunshine into your day for everyone who is listening. We got about one more minute, and then we'll kick off. Ah, so it's about that time. So it is now 10 a.m. We are going to kick off as soon as I can figure out my mouse. Today we are here to talk about the uh, top 10 accounting industry trends uh, and what to watch for in 2019. Um, my name is Andrew Wall. I will be your host or your presenter today. Uh, I've also got Corey who's going to help with me to monitor uh, some of the chats and Corey, you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Corey Bullock. I'm here at Intuit. I'm one of the account managers for, uh, for uh, Canada here. I'm one of, I manage relationships with accounts and bookkeepers in Toronto. I am Andrew's lovely assistant today. I will be answering or making sure that any questions that you submit in the question box will not go unanswered. And uh, as questions come up, Andrew has instructed me to just interrupt him to make sure that nothing is left off the table. Thank you, Corey. Yes, we really appreciate your help because I know sometimes it can be hard to uh, to both speak and read for me. So uh, Corey will be a big help to make sure that we don't miss any of those uh, questions in the panel. I am very open to keeping this a dialogue rather than a monologue uh, and do encourage people if you do have questions throughout the session to please post those questions and share them as we go. 
um, and I'll do my best to answer them to the best of my ability. As I mentioned, my name is Andrew Wall. Uh, I am a CPA based out of here in Toronto. My background before becoming a CPA was I was actually a software developer, built an application uh, for my father, which was an online accounting based application uh, that allowed us to do accounting and bookkeeping on the internet before it was called the cloud. So that's a little bit about me. I'm also very active on social, uh, connected with many of you already. For those of you who I'm not connected with, I do encourage you to connect with me on social media so we can continue the conversation after this session. You can find me on Twitter at WallCPA. You can also find me on Instagram at WallCPA. You can find me on LinkedIn at LinkedIn slash IN slash Small Business Accountant. And you can also find me on Facebook. So for those of you who were on earlier, I did mention um, that we've done some great video sessions, live videos from QB Connect in Toronto. So if you have any interest in checking those out, you can find those on my Facebook page. But without further ado, I want to talk a little bit about what our agenda for today is going to be. So we're going to talk to you about accounting industry trends, the top accounting industry trends for 2019. Uh, for, so before I get right into those top 10 trends that I uh, 4C is I want to talk to you about how to stay on top of those industry trends and then we'll get right into what I've picked as the top 10. Now these are just my pick. It's not to say that I'm 100% accurate. These are just the technologies um, and the trends that I think are going to have potentially the largest impact. There's lots of other uh, tech and trend that we couldn't possibly cover today. Um, and in fact, it's going to be very difficult for me to cover these in immense detail because each one of these trends could justify their own individual webinar. Um, so I'll do my best to, to give you high levels of what they are and why I think they're important. Uh, but feel free to jump in if you have questions along the way. Before we wrap up, though, I want to make sure that we talk to you about how to leverage these trends for your business and try to give you guys a bit of a strategy on how to implement those in your business because I think the whole point of being here and understanding what these top trends are is to make sure that you are going to leverage these and get the most out of them for your own individual businesses as well as for your clients who can also benefit from these trends that are taking place. So without further ado, let's talk, let's take a poll question. Um, so I think I am supposed to do these poll questions. So let me launch our first poll question. Um, how important is it, do you think it is to stay on top of industry trends? Um, so I believe I am launching that. Launch now. So if you guys would take a moment just to answer this super quick, I'd love to get your feedback. Um, hopefully you guys recognize the importance and the value of this, but I do appreciate that there is this balance between running your business and looking forward about what's coming down the pipeline. And it is a fairly equal balance, so much so that we have right now close to a 50-50 split between critical and important. So everyone understands the value, but is it critical to running your business? That I guess is the optimum question. And I guess that depends on the nature of your business. Are you you know, uh, a industry leader and you want to make sure that you are on top and leading the industry? Um, are you just wanting to leverage it for yourself? Ultimately, that's the question. But everyone at least understands that it is, at the very least, important as opposed to somewhat important or not at all important. Um, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, this was basically just to confirm the facts and basically help me to understand who I'm speaking with in the audience. So thank you guys for taking that poll. And let's jump right into how to stay on top of these industry trends. So you all know how important it is to be on top of these. How I do it. And maybe that will help you. So one of the big things that I do is I follow some of the key influencers. The key influencers, not only in my community, uh, but outside of this community as well. And some of the influencers in our own community have been big influences in, the, in fact, even some of the content that I'll be presenting today. You know, I talked earlier about doing sessions with Hector Garcia because I think what he is doing on social media um, and YouTube in particular um, are leading edge as far as what we should be doing as a community. You know, I've also gotten feedback from people like Jacob Schroeder, who's given me some input on things like OCR and ICR. You know, I talked to Kelly from Chata.ai, who I think really understands deep learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence in a way that goes well over my head. Um, so meeting and connecting with these influencers is a big part of how I learn and understand what's going on in technology and trends. 
um, as well as attending industry conferences. So we just came back from QB Connect in Toronto, which was an amazing event. Um, had too good of a time probably, but I learned so much. Um, I was lucky to participate prior to the actual QB Connect event as a judge in the hackathon. And these hackathons, if you haven't participated or attended these hackathons, I really encourage each of you to get out there and connect with our developers because there is such a need to connect these people who understand technology and the ability to build uh um, applications and tools to help solve our problems and connecting them with people like accountants and bookkeepers who know what those problems are in small businesses because as a judge that's one of the things that we definitely found needed some some help is connecting these two people so I think it's important for you guys to connect to help those developers but also connect to help you understand what's going on with technology and it was really inspiring to participate as a judge um, this year and also last year in San Jose to participate as an actual hacker and seeing what these bright minds are doing and the technology that they're working with, um, whether it's natural language processing and voice, uh, artificial intelligence, um, computer vision, they are so far ahead of us, it's unbelievable. And I think one of the things is, as an industry, we are somewhat laggards within technology. Now, that's a generalism. Obviously, there's some people who are really far are ahead of the curve, but most of us are late adopters in this community. Um, so what I'm going to be talking to you today about is not necessarily future tech. It's tech that exists today that's here. It's more about where we're moving along this adoption curve and the fact that we're now moving from the uh, um, early adopters to the late majority. I'm starting to see some of this technology become widely adapted and adopted in our uh, community or what I predict will become more widely adopted. Um, so attending industry conferences is a huge part of how I do my learning, as is joining Facebook groups. We all, I think many of us are already connected in, in many of the Facebook groups, but the point of the Facebook groups to me is connecting with community. It's these relationships, these conversations that I might have in side chats, in uh, chats on the public forum, the relationships that I'll build that will ultimately lead to real world conversations at conferences, at events, um, that help me to hear from others because it's impossible for any one of us to be on top of all of the technology and trends. Um, and different people have different passions and interests and we'll see from them where they're what they're working on and learn from them and help us to stay on top of those trends. Like again, looking to industry leaders, what, what I see with Ainsley Damery out in the UK, what he's doing with uh, blockchain and ICOs, which we'll talk about. I mean, they're revolutionary and his knowledge of that in that community goes far beyond what I could possibly know and understand. So having conversations with him about why he's doing it and what he's doing it really helps to inspire me and help me get a feel for what's happening and how our industry is moving along that adoption curve. Because to me, when I talk about industry trends, it really is the movement along the adoption curve. It's not so much about technology that doesn't exist. So I'm not trying to be a futurist of what technologies we're going to be seeing in the future, but really more talk to you about the technologies that are here today um, that are going to, what I believe are going to become more widely adopted over the next year and the next coming years. So without further ado, let's get into the big ones with, well, before we do that, sorry, another poll question. Um, so I got one more poll question here. How do you stay on top of these industry trends? I'd be curious to see how many of you use any of these trends that I do and how many of you use different trends. So we'll launch that poll, try to give you some real time feedback as you guys answer this for me. Um, 100%, uh, no, 50%, these, is, these are moving quickly. Um, so we're looking at uh, Facebook groups as being the strong industry leader. Uh, we've got about 22% other. Um, we've got a fair number of you who don't stay on top of industry trends. I'm going to call you on that because you're here today, which means you are staying on top of industry trends, at least in some way, shape, or form. Um, very few of you are following influencers. And I guess following influencers doesn't necessarily mean on social, but I mean connecting with them, building relationships with them. I think that's such an important part of learning and growth is networking and building relationships with those people who are maybe a little bit further along the adoption curve than you. And what we're so lucky about in this community is that we have those people who are further along the adoption curve who are willing to help out and provide feedback and advice. And I know it was a big help for me um, as I came into this industry, I had people like Jason Blummer, um, the guys at Live CA, um, who were further along the adoption curve who really helped me to, to find my feet. Um, so that's, uh, let me post this, uh, I'm going to close this 
poll now and post that. So it looks like the largest is Facebook groups. So that's where most people are getting their um, their feedback and their knowledge, which is great. I'm not surprised at that because I think Facebook is the most widely adopted social platform. Uh, but I do encourage you to make sure that you attend these industry conferences because we only got about 16% of you who are actually attending conferences as a way of learning. And what I can tell you is from me, attending these conferences is such a huge value for looking at where, you know, billion dollar companies like Intuit are planning to invest and where they're going to go with technology helps you to plan for your business because they tell you about where they are now, but they also give you the roadmap of where they want to go. And that can really help you and your business to plan for the direction of where you want to take them. Now, I really do need to get further along this presentation because I'm 12 minutes in and a little bit further behind. Um, so let me uh, hide that poll and move further along uh, and talk to you guys about blockchain. In my opinion, blockchain is arguably the most important piece of technology to affect our industry. The problem is we are extremely early along the adoption curve, not only in our industry, um, but in just about any industry. Now, the most important thing I want to say about blockchain is blockchain is not Bitcoin, okay? I think that was Liliette's uh, comment from QB Connect where a Aidsley Damery session on, on blockchain went a little bit sideways. But blockchain is not Bitcoin. Uh, cryptocurrencies use the blockchain um, to create the these, these currencies. Now, an important thing to know and understand is that blockchain was actually created in 1991 as actually a form of time stamping things. Um, it is a, an immutable, distributed, you can think of it like a database. <clears throat> what it is, is it's a chain of blocks. Each block contains essentially three things. It contains a chunk of data, which could be virtually anything. It includes its own individual hash, and it includes a link to the hash from the previous block. What that means is if you want to change a block on the blockchain, you would have to change that block and all other blocks that are connected thereafter, which becomes difficult in and of itself. But then because you have what's called a distributed ledger, which is on multiple machines, it means you'd have to change it on that machine plus on every other machine, which becomes computationally very difficult to do, even though we've got extremely powerful computers, which makes it a very secure way of storing data, which is why it ultimately led to things like cryptocurrencies, um, because it was this immutable, trusted source of data. It is creating a whole bunch of opportunities and things that we can do with it because of things like cryptocurrencies and initial coin offerings. And I want to touch briefly on into initial coin offerings because I think that they are really interesting. You can think of these, so um, cryptocurrencies are not a security, they're not regulated in the same way that securities are regulated, which brings with them a whole bunch of issues, which I, I won't get into today. But what initial coin offerings are is sort of, the best way someone explained it to me is think of it as somewhere between a Kickstarter campaign and a IPO. It's a way of raising money um, that isn't traditional equity financing. And it is potentially really interesting for providing alternative ways of generating money for companies that want to do really new and interesting things. So if you want to know more about ICOs and what those are, I encourage you to reach out to Ainsley Damery, who's an influencer who's doing something really interesting with ICO in his Clarity project. But unfortunately, I don't really have time to go into that in detail today. The reason that I believe blockchain is going to become a big trend in the, the coming year is because for the very first time this year, when I was in San Jose, I saw an app that was actually based off of blockchain. That's the first time that we've seen that despite blockchain being around for a while. So PayPi um, is a blockchain based app. Uh, they have a very uh, large goal outside of the PayPi, which is built on another uh, infrastructure done by the same company. Um, their goal is to have this idea of a triple entry accounting system, which means if we have this immutable source that cannot be changed and we can tie that to data and that data could be transactions, could we not then eliminate audits because we use a triple entry system where every transaction is then recorded in the blockchain? Really potentially interesting concept. At this point, it's little more than a concept. No one has really deployed anything substantial in it. Um, again, if you want to reach out and learn more, talk to the guys from PayPi. They are geniuses. They really know and understand what's going on with blockchain and where that could go. But I think this has a massive, massive potential impact uh, on our industry. We're in the very early days, but I'd still probably rank it as number one as the most potential impact on our community. Uh, although it might take us a while, we're very early 
on on that adoption curve, but it is exciting to see for the very first time apps on the app showroom floor that are building on blockchain. And I think to me that that is, that is really exciting stuff. Now, the other big thing here is artificial intelligence. Um, this is a toss up between what's my number one and what's my number two. Oh, Corey, you got a question for me? Yeah, sorry. I want to yep. uh, hop in here because yep. a couple questions about. Uh, uh, actually, we're going to go. We're going to go back a little bit to more of the influencer com conversations. Uh, there are some questions about how sure. people can get in touch sure. with them. So, how, how do you recommend if, if someone was interested in uh, getting in touch with or following some of these influencers? How would they go about doing that? So, first of all, figure out what channel they're on. They might be on Facebook. They might be on. Um, Twitter, they might be on Instagram, they might be on multiple channels, they might be on LinkedIn. So connect with them on whatever channel they seem to be using the most. Actually engage with them, like a couple of their, if it's Twitter, like a bunch of their tweets so that they, you show up on their channel, tweet at them, connect with them. And the goal of this is start to build a conversation. Um, ideally, it's going to lead to a face-to-face. In all reality, face-to-faces may not be possible. Um, my number one thing would be don't ask for something before you give something. So one of the big things is that we, some of the influencers in the community are asked a lot of times about a lot of questions. And we're usually more than willing to give back. Um, but don't lead with your question. Just like, you know, on LinkedIn, if, if someone friends me on LinkedIn and the first thing they do is try to pitch me their product, the first thing I do is unfriend them. Um, so don't lead with... Um, hey, I got a question for you. Don't lead with an ask. You know, there's a great book by Gary Vaynerchuk called uh, Jab, Jab, Hook. What is it? Jab, Jab, Uppercut. Uh, I forget what it's called. But anyone know the name of that book? Someone's got a comment. Someone's got to give me it. It's Jab, Jab, something. But um, it's a great book about this idea of adding value and giving back. All right. Um, another question here. I know that uh, some of the popular Facebook groups are uh, QBHQ and QBO and Quinty. Are there any others that you recommend? Get into it. Brad, Brad, Brad would, would scream at me if I didn't mention get into it. Um, there's other ones, Workflow Watering Hole. Um, there's BWAM out of the States. So, I mean, if you're looking for Canadian-specific content, there's probably no larger group than QBHQ. Um, I think it's got over 2,000 members now. Uh, Quinty in the Cloud is another one. It's, it's now ag gone ag agnostic, so it's not QBO specific. Um, you know, I, I think that there's more and more we're starting to see these narrow ones. Um, but there's a number of ones out there uh, out in the U.S. that are um, really good. Like there's BWAM, QB Power Hour. Um, you know, Hector's got like three or four groups going on. Um, and, and they're sort of like, um, you know, done by vertical. So he's got one for QBO, which is the QBO Power Hour, then he's got one for video marketing. I forget what that, that one's called. Maybe someone can help me there. Um, there's a lot of really good groups out there right now. I think the hard part that I find with these groups is now there are becoming so many groups is figuring out which ones you, you stay in and communicate with. It's a difficult time from my perspective for Facebook groups, although they do still add a tremendous amount of value. Awesome. Thank you. So is that uh, any other questions out there, Corey, or should I continue on? Uh, so just, um, I guess, one other point here. Um, the current app partners that uh, are a lot of the major ones that connect to QBO right now, um, those are, do, do you know if those are currently operating with any sort of blockchain, or is it just the one that you mentioned that's uh, getting... getting PayPi is so the that's... only one that I am aware of that is using blockchain, that is built on blockchain. Okay. There may be more, but that's the only one I am personally aware of. Perfect. Okay. Um, so let's talk about artificial. Uh, let's talk about artificial intelligence. Um, the biggest game changer that affects so many of the other trends that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, now, artificial intelligence is a bit of a generic term. It just basically means a computer that can learn, and that can go back to basically simple programming. Um, to more complex things like uh, machine learning, natural language processing, and deep learning. Deep learning is where we're getting a lot of the big uh, mass of changes. Um, deep learning helps us to take nonlinear data and, and, and be able to create correlations in a nonlinear format, um, help us to answer questions that we wouldn't normally be able to do. Um, I'm going to attempt to give you a bit of an analogy on what deep learning is. 
um, because it is a really complex topic. Um, But what you can think of it is, is data goes in and there's this big magic black box and an answer comes out. And what's inside that black box is this concept of these neurons, um, which is intended to be based off of the concept of a neural network in our brains um, where we have all these different neurons which are these different data points or or different um, calculations that are all intricately related to the data that goes in and you have the ability um, to train this black box or train this neural network um, based on existing information and these things fire off very complex computations and each neuron triggers and affects another neuron um, and so you'll be able to get these really complex non-linear data sets uh, to f- figure out uh, information that um, would be very difficult to figure out uh, without doing this and you're able to train these things and build these networks very effectively and very quickly um, and the beautiful thing about it is there's now these um, code bases of different neural networks or different um, different black boxes Um, by different industries. So what's going to happen is these neural networks are only going to get better and better and better as we go. Um, And the more data that goes into them, um, the better that they learn. Because basically the the point of this is you have these these weights and these biases um, that you set up initially, but then based off of the outcomes, like how accurate the outcomes are, it readjusts the base and the, base and the, and the biases to create an even more accurate system. So it just gets more and more and more accurate as we go. It's largely based off of linear algebra, um, and it's very complicated. Um, but for the layman, the most important thing is that it's this it's black box that can answer question and, com- and and do mathematical computation, computation extraordinarily fast um, and be able to learn as the uh, learn from its own outputs. And so it's really exciting and really exciting time because of all the different industries that this is going to have an impact on. Um, machine learning it, itself is, again, a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, it's a little bit more basic than the idea of deep learning. Um, and more, it's le- less based on this layered set of neurons and more based on, you know, hey, do you like a lot of um, bo- uh, movies on Netflix that are, you know, horrors? Then we're going to present and show you more movies on Netflix that are horrors. So that is, you know, it's machine learning, but it's not this concept of a neuron-based um, multi-layered approach, um, which is going to be really interesting. And again, um, deep learning is a big part of natural language processing. So if you think of this Venn diagram, where we've got a big circle of artificial intelligence, inside of that is machine learning, inside of machine learning is natural language, and inside of natural language is, or inside of machine learning um, and with natural language inside of deep learning is the this core of deep learning, which is where um, all of the big changes are coming. And that's really only really since like 2006, seven ish um, and so it's amazing how much that technology has um, revolutionized what we've seen in that short period of time. Um, and we do have this this hockey stir, hockey stick curve of growth because we have the ability now to share these uh, neural networks or these black boxes amongst different groups to allow, allow people to learn and grow based on other people's learning and growth, which means that we're just going to catapult ourselves into these unbelievable times of technology, which I'm really excited about. But again, I'm going to move on from this because we're at 1025 right now, and I've got a lot of things to go through. Um, So we've got the cloud. The cloud is another um, obviously big trend in the industry. It's nothing new. Um, Most of you who are here are here because you were invited by Intuit, um, which means you're probably using their product, which means that you are in the cloud. Um, The cloud basically just means any software that is um, running over the internet as opposed to on a server in your office. Um, now, what's happening is we're seeing companies move from just a software that's hosted on the internet um, to platforms. So QuickBooks is a platform. Salesforce is a platform. So a platform, the easiest way to understand it is anything um, where you're seeing apps being built specifically on or for this platform. Um, and so we have ecosystems built within these uh, software platforms which are enabled through the this concept of the application programming interface, which is just a way for softwares that are hosted online to be able to share and communicate information back and forth. But what's really interesting about a platform is a platform enables 
other softwares to build off of their APIs and to continue upon those APIs to build in more effects functionality um, and and technology. And I think what's really interesting is we're starting to see um, companies, so Method CRM, a, a Toronto-based uh, company, has a non-code uh, development tool which allows you to interact and leverage the API of QPO of QBO without knowing anything about programming. And that to me is the catalyst for what's going to be happening over the next little while, which is now the ability for accountants and bookkeepers to start integrating and leveraging the power of the API who don't know anything about software development and programming. So I think that this is a really interesting time. I think we're also going to see some big changes in, and maybe not big changes, but improvements in greater um, inter-app uh, contextuality as apps are able to connect and communicate not only with our core QuickBooks, but also with each other. So we're starting to see integrations between uh, practice ignition um, and other platforms, timesheets and uh, T-sheets and WagePoint. Um, so we're seeing some really interesting things there. Um, and I know I'm going long-winded on this, but I think these are two of the biggest platforms. And I know I'm almost halfway, half an hour in, and I've only covered two topics. So I'll, I promise I'll speed up. Um, but I'm also really excited about where we're going with bank integrations. I did a whole, you know, half an hour session with Jeff Cates at QB Connect, talking about what's going on in Europe with banking integrations and APIs, which ultimately came out of legislation that forced the banks to do it. You know, we've got banks here in Canada that have talked about doing it and talked about releasing APIs. Um, and so it's inevitable that it'll happen. Uh, unfortunately, if it doesn't become legislated, it'll probably move at a bit of a snail's pace, um, but it will inevitably come, which gives us greater access to the critical information that we need to be able to do our job, which is this banking information. Um, QuickBooks also announced it at QuickBooks Connect that they're going to have this bank fetch feature uh, coming down the road eminently, which is really exciting because that's one of the things that everybody loves about HubDoc. Um, so to be able to have this built right into QBO is going to be amazing. But again, I'm going to digress and get to some of our other topics here. Um, so security. Security is going to be another big trend. Um, for those of you who aren't in the know, there was a big uh, data breach recently with the Marriott Hotels. It was massive. Um, the reality is we're going to probably be in an era where we're going to continue to have um, other data breaches. And unfortunately, it is a reality of the world that we live in. Um, one thing, I, you know, I shared a flight back um, from San Jose when I was down there for Accountants Council, and I sat next to a security guy from the, from the Valley, and I had a really interesting conversation with him about security and protection of data and cloud versus um, you, you know, your own hosted environments. And what he told me is he said, uh, I got bad news for you. Virtually every system has already been hacked, uh, but it's not been hacked by the people you would actually expect. It's mostly been hacked by other governments. Um, and what I did not realize um, until he informed me was that even Canada has a budget for outbound cyber warfare, which I was not aware of. Um, so the, the, these big full-scale attacks in many situations are conducted by governments rather than, you know, the nefarious hacker that you see in movies who's, you know, trying to, you know, make some money off of hacking. Those hacks are more traditionally done on the more vulnerable systems, the home PCs, uh, where we're seeing, um, you know, um, malwares and um, ransomwares more important, more, more specifically, um, where they're able to target these less protected, less sophisticated systems. Because the advantage that you have in the cloud, even though they're a larger target, um, they have much more secure, much more complex security infrastructure than you would ever have. You know, I think a, a complicated accounting practice might be, who's sophisticated, might happen to have a firewall and think that that is a great form of protection. Again, the same security guard told me firewalls are basically useless. Um, and now we're in the age where we're using AI, again, artificial intelligence and, and uh, deep learning uh, and these neural networks to be able to defend against hacks um, because the hacks are coming from AI and machine learning and in more complicated uh, and more sophisticated ways than we've ever seen uh, in the past. So we have to deal with those in a more sophisticated way. Security will continue to be a factor, um, as will data rights. Um, you know, we've got in Europe the General Data Protection Regulation, 
uh, which probably most of you know and understand is all those warnings on websites saying, telling you that they're using cookies because now they have to tell you when they're using cookies, which is a form of helping you to protect your data and giving you rights to your data. There's going to be some big conversations going on in the near future about who owns what data um, and how, to, how you're obligated to protect that data if you are collecting it. Um, I think we're we're overdue for some of those conversations here in Canada. Um, so I expect we would have similar types of things like uh, GDPR uh, coming through to Canada. Um, so it's some interesting times for security. But again, I want to sort of digress and, and move along here. If my computer will respond. There we go. Voice integration. I am... Very excited by voice because I use voice a lot. Um, I have Alexa. I have Siri. Technically, I have Cortana, though I don't use it. Um, I have Google Assistant, though I don't really use it. Um, it's becoming really interesting because of this concept of contextual understanding. For those of you who didn't see it, Google did this big press release earlier this year showing off Google Assistant where they um, had someone call into a salon, a hair, a hair salon, I make an appointment in this in this very elaborate, very detailed back and forth conversation that enabled um, the Google Assistant to schedule and book an appointment with a person who was calling in. So what this really illustrates is this idea of contextual understanding. So what you know is fairly new is this idea of contextual understanding because prior to contextual understanding, you could uh, ask a uh, ask Siri a question. Um, and then when you ask the next question, she wouldn't remember what you'd asked before or be able to relate the current question to what happened in the last question, um, which is we as humans just do naturally. Um, and so conversations um, with Siri where it's not contextual are they don't work. They're not they're, they don't they're not natural and they don't work very well. So as we um, get further and further along this um, this progress with contextual understanding, those conversations with voice assistants are just going to get better and better. And I know for myself, I do like the idea of integrating with, or interacting with my data through the form of voice um, because sometimes it's just easier to just ask a question than to type it all out. Um, so right now we're at a point where I think we're in a bit of a brand race. Um, the big leaders seem to be uh, Siri and Alexa, um, but there will be a big brand race and a lot of push um, from technology and people to, to build off of those. One of the great things about Google Assistant, um, which may not have as much market penetration right now, is that they've got an open API, again, allowing you to build off of it. So, I mean, ultimately, there's going to eventually become this, well, not going to be there already is this uh, Android Apple Rift uh, closed infrastructure versus open infrastructure um, and what that means as far as how uh, things will be built out and when you've got an open infrastructure like you do with Google Assistant you tend to get explosive growth because you've got a whole development community who starts building off of that so I think there will be a brand race um, there's going to be still issues around privacy um, you know there's the, the reality of having something like Siri uh, or Alexa is you have these always on devices that are always listening. Um, and is that an invasion of your privacy? Is this uh, big brother? Um, yeah, it probably is a little bit uh, how some people will absolutely refuse to have these devices on or in their homes. Um, Cause we have seen, I think the very first court case that has used Google assistant used uh, information from Google assistant in that court case. Um, so, you know, Potentially, uh, it's an issue. Potentially, it's another form of protection. Um, you know, if you think about having security cameras in your house, which I have, um, as a form of protection, yes, that information on those security cameras could maybe be used against me, um, but they're there to protect me. Uh, you know, always on listening could be used against me, but it's also there as a way to protect me. And you know, imagine if something were to go wrong in my home. You know, we now potentially have a voice recording of that. Um, so some big questions for debate when it comes to voice integration. Uh, but as far as the actual technology, I think it's just going to get better and better and uh, more uh, and, and more a part of our lives. I know I just bought an Amazon Fire Stick. So Amazon Fire Stick now 
has voice integration in the remote. We're even seeing with, you know, uh, Rogers, which is the big cable provider here, you've now got voice built into your remote and being able to do voice search for television. It's going to become a bigger part of everything we do in our lives. Um, and I think that will then naturally lend its way into the accounting and bookkeeping world, as we're already seeing with uh, the QB assistant. So it's happening, it's just gonna get better and better and better. Like I said at the very beginning of this, it's not so much about future tech, it's about technology that's here uh, that we're gonna start making better use of. Now, this um, this trend, I'm gonna, you know, cards on the table, inherent bias. I'm a big believer in benchmarking. We've been doing benchmarking for a long time. I think it is critical for accountants and financial professionals to be doing some form of benchmarking uh, to help your clients. Um, many people have been doing internal benchmarking for long periods of time where you're comparing against um, other people in your uh, or, or comparing against sort of your past or your projected future numbers. Uh, not enough people are doing external benchmarks comparing to averages and uh, medians. Now, um, you know, Intuit has put this on their, their product roadmap um, that they want to be able to, to be able to give you the ability to do um, external benchmarks against aggregate data that they have on their millions of users in their system. This could be an immensely powerful tool, especially when you combine it with what they're talking about doing around AI-driven analysis, um, which would basically give you the ability to, you know, make recommendations and suggestions. You know, you're below the um, industry averages in this one category, and other people are spending, you know, a large amount of money at this one particular vendor, and you're not spending any money. Um, you can bubble up recommendations. You can bubble up trends, you can bubble up so many pieces of information that will help us as accountants to be able to do better analysis and help us with our clients to help them grow their businesses better. So I think that that's really, again, some pretty interesting times. Um, but cards on the table, inherent bias, it's probably on here because I think it's so important. Social media, another inherent bias. Uh, as I said at the very beginning of this presentation, I'm a big believer in social media. I think on the adoption curve, we are now fairly far along the adoption curve. I think the biggest problem we have here is that some people are on it because they've been told they have to be on it rather than leveraging it for its true value. Um, and there is immense value. The last conference, uh, QB Connect, I had 3.5 million impressions in one week. And when I was in San Jose, it was seven point something million impressions. The amount of money that it would have cost me to get that level of impressions in traditional media uh, would be completely unaffordable for a business my size. Um, so this is a this is you know the slingshot that allows um, David to defeat Goliath and to compete with those big industry brands. So I think that those of you who who aren't quite leveraging this yet to its maximum. I think you really need to get onto those, the sessions that we have specific to social media on how you can leverage it because it is the great equalizer. Now, where do I see, what do I see as far as trends in social media? Live video is huge. That's why you see me doing so much of it right now. You get these added bumps by the algorithms that underlie um, the social medias, which are, by the way, are driven by AI and deep learning. Um, but they uh, bump certain content based on certain algorithms and they're trying to promote video right now so live video gets bumped so you get more views and more likes and all that fun stuff another big thing is stories stories again that get a big bump stories really started with uh, snapchat which is all but dying now because uh, when they put stories into instagram most of the people moved over to instagram um, and now you're seeing stories now as a part of facebook um, these are those things that are um, that last for a short period of time and then are intended to disappear um, it's the fleeting nature of content, unfortunately, in this era that we live in. Um, but if you want to leverage the power of growth, um, stories and live video are probably the key for that when it comes to social media. But again, if you want to learn more about this, I encourage you to come out and attend one of the sessions specifically dedicated to social media because you really need at least a full hour dedicated to this, if not multiple hours dedicated to this to really get the most out of it. Um, but the most important thing I want to say is, is social listening and engaging, making sure that you're not just pushing content, that you're listening to people and that you're connecting and engaging and having conversations. Um, so that's my two cents on, again, my bias. Um, now, chatbots. This, you know, I almost argue if this should be further up on on my list of, of top trends because um, I think this is going to be a really interesting thing over the next little while. 
Um, just left a message for for Kelly from Chatted at AI uh, to talk to him about what they're doing and, and some ideas that I have that I think will will make that product even better than it is. Um, but again, what's happened here that we've seen is again this this growth in natural language processing, which allows us to interpret uh, intent and deal with people who are you know saying what uh, using common language and how does that then translate to the actual information that they're hoping to get out of this and produce relevant search re results is getting better and better and better every year. And again, this is thanks to um, artificial intelligence and deep learning and the ability to learn from the data. So the more data that gets into this, the better that these systems uh, become. And the reason that chatbots have so much potential and why I think they're going to be really booming, even though, again, they're not new technology, is they give us a way to answer questions really quickly. Um, so if you think about when you call into a support line um, at any technical software, or if you call in to ask a question for from an accountant, um, then in many times, um, if the person doesn't have the answer handy, they're Googling it and searching it in knowledge bases um, and having to look things up. Now you can have that done by a computer who can do that far faster, who can cross-reference it, who can also use deep learning to, to determine and that how accurate was the result, and it can get better at producing better and more accurate results all the time, whereas an individual is not going to learn quite as effectively and quickly um, as a computer can. And so having the ability to have clients ask a question through a chatbot and have that answered quickly and easily is a really powerful and effective thing. And I think that what's the reason that I see it as being such a big trend for 2019 is because of the fact that it's becoming better conversationally and contextually so that it seems more natural. It doesn't feel like you're typing something into a Google search. It feels like it's conversational, which becomes easier for us to use um, and a better tool for us. Also, the other thing is with the chatbots is they have the ability that when they're not being effective to push off to a real person fairly seamlessly. So I think chatbots are, are a big thing um, thanks to sentiment analysis, natural language processing, search relevance, and artificial intelligence, which are just some big things from some other areas. So I'm really excited about what's coming down the road with chatbots. Intelligent. Hey, Andrew, just a yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We got a uh, question, and this is actually not from the, uh, the chatbot section, but from uh, right before it, I believe, from the social media page. Um, sure. Someone's asking, sure. you know, when, when you're talking about these, these sessions, how do you, um, how do you find them? Are, are, you, are these just things that you find at conferences or are there other ways that you get in touch with these? So there are, so sessions just like we're putting on today, Intuit has this whole um, um, program and I can tell you I've done earlier sessions and Corey, maybe you can help us find some of those earlier sessions that I've done for you guys. Um, Intuit does a really good job of helping to promote this, uh, you know, live at conferences. There's always always a session or two on social media whenever you go to QB Connect. Um, but I know for a fact there are pre-recorded ones that are, exist out there. Um, ultimately, um, I'm going to have to push this off to Intuit to answer because I developed the content for Intuit, so it's their content. Um, and uh, where they host it is, is up to them. Um, and how they distribute it is up to them. So Corey, I'm gonna I'm gonna push this back to you um, and your team to see if you can share those out. I'm from my perspective, uh, I know I've done them with you guys and, and they're they're recorded. So I'm happy to share them if you guys are. Which yeah, may I'll not be different. Yes. yes. Okay. So sorry to put you on the spot here, Corey. <laughs> it's all good, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so getting back to intelligent document capture and computer vision. Um, as I said, I put this on because of Jacob Schroeder. Um, I was talking to him about what does he see as, as big trends. Um, and he listed this one. I was like, wow, really? You know, because to me, intelligent document capture and OCR, optical character recognition, uh, is almost a little bit passe because it's being so widely adopted in our community. You know, you look at HubDoc, you look at Receipt Bank, um, you look at Expensify. Um, these are doing OCR and intelligent document capture really well. Um, but when I broadened it a little bit to also include computer vision, this is where I start to get really excited. Um, so when I was at the hackathon in San Jose, I saw people starting to do stuff with computer vision. So um, computer vision is, is this idea of using your camera on potentially on your smartphone or on computers 
um, to recognize information. And then it uses deep learning and artificial intelligence and all the other stuff um, to be able to make decisions. So your input is the computer vision. Your output could be virtually anything. Um, where I saw it being used in really interesting and creative ways is we saw an app who did an inventory system that was based off of computer visioning. So in their minimum viable product demonstration, they put up, excuse me, three cans of pop, I think it was, and then they took one away. And when it took, when you took one away, the computer visioning recognized that it, you took the Pepsi away and it updated the inventory and automatically reordered stock. Um, this was a minimum viable concept of what you could do with it. Uh, to me, it was really interesting. I also saw someone in Toronto do something with computer visioning where they basically said, instead of using um, barcode software, um, which can be expensive um, to have PO expensive POS retail systems, um, he had this idea of using computer visioning to just be able to automatically recognize uh, things. And, and what that could bring with it is the power to literally be in a store, take a picture of the document, pay for everything on the store, and the cashier sees that you're approved to walk out the door with that. I mean, some pretty exciting things uh, very early days with, with computer visioning and what we can do. Um, and high-speed computer visioning is is really impressive stuff. So I think I'm excited about that. Um, from intelligent document uh, capture and OCR-based technology, I think we're, we're knocking it out of the park already with what we're doing um, with OCR and with recognizing invoices and receipts and bank statements. I think that there's going to be potential for now how we apply this over to our clients. Um, and having customized uh, documents and, and, and non-customized, non-standard documents that we're able to recognize through OCR and help automate processes. I can think to one a specific example that we had. We, we get a lot of referral business from staffing agencies, um, and we had a staffing agency that was doing a lot of event business, and they needed to track hours for this thing. And I'm like, okay, well, why don't you just you know build out a little app? Because, uh, I mean, we're talking large-scale events. It was... Um, it was a massive event and, you know, thousands of, of workers. It was a big project. So I'm like, oh, just build out an app and have everyone enter it into the app. Problem solved. He's like, yeah, these guys don't use apps. Some of them have phones and those – some of them don't have phones and those of them who do have phones just aren't very technology savvy, won't be able to figure out. They need pen and paper. I'm like, okay, OCR technology. Have them use a standard form and then use the OCR technology to feed that into your – um, uh, to your payroll system, which is ultimately what they ended up doing. So I, I think that, that um, the level of being able to do that and be able to tie in OCR document capture um, with um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and deep learning and that stuff, um, there's product out there called Effisoft, um, which allows you to, to create these artificially um, – um, artificial intelligence driven analysis on documents. So you can train a document very easily and very quickly uh, and build off of artificial intelligence and deep learning um, without having a lot of computer software development skill and background. And I think that's the really interesting thing to me about all these different technologies is we're at this time where we're now creating all this great technology, but now we're enabling people who don't necessarily have software programming and software development skills to be able to use these tools, um, which now is going to now start to really solve those difficult problems. Because as I said very earlier, one of the things I see over and over again at these hackathons is that we've got great tech talent and great um, business knowledge, but they're not in the same camps. We've got the techs and the devs, and we've got the accountants, the bookkeepers, and the small business owners who know and understand the issues. And, you know, the crossover is, is small. There's only a small percentage of accountants that are coming over to the dev events. There's only a small percentage of the devs that are coming over to the accounting events. We've got to do a better job of integrating those. Uh, technology is helping us to do that because it's going to give you, the accountants and financial advisors and professionals, the ability to build stuff out without having to have a lot of technology knowledge. Um, and a great example of that is methods non-coding um, environment, which allows you to leverage the power of APIs to in a non-coding way to do that. Another great example is Zapier. So Zapier is basically giving you the ability to interact with all these APIs and all these technologies, but not really having to be, you know, a programmer or a developer to be able to interact and, and connect to these different APIs. So you can take your business knowledge, like Heather Satterley is doing, and build all, all these reusable, effectively code bases that you can sell off to clients, um, which is awesome because when we can move um, from a service business to a product business, um, 
there's uh, you know it's far easier to scale a product business than it is a service business. And if you think of these things that Heather is building as these little products, um, these little uh, code bases that are reusable that she can sell off. I mean, I think she's brilliant. I think uh, um, uh, what they're doing over there with with Zapier um, is huge. So probably should have had Zapier as an individual technology. Um, the last thing I want to want to close with, and probably the weakest thing, it's not even a technology thing, um, so to speak of, but it is still such a massive impact, is this concept of the age wave. And I kind of look at it as a technology trend um, because you know generalisms are horrible, um, and, and this is a big generalization. Uh, but generally speaking, millennials are very comfortable with technology and boomers are less so. I can guarantee you I've met many boomers who are great with technology. I've met many millennials that suck with technology. Um, but generally speaking, millennials are more comfortable with it, which means that, again, the adoption curve of all these things that we talked about earlier, we're going to just start to see a rapid uptake in the um, improvement in what these tools can do and the adoption. Because as I said earlier, this is really not about – what new technologies I'm expecting to come down the road in 2019. It's the adoption of the existing technologies. Everything that I talked about today is not future tech. It's today tech. It already exists. It's more about how we're going to start seeing the adoption curve of these technologies um, become move from you know the, the early adopters to the late majority. Um, and that's sort of how I position it. And I think the millennials will help us to see that. Um, we do still have a, a bit of an issue with succession. Uh, we have uh, boomers who, who don't want to retire. Um, as my father says, it's not like it's lifting bricks. You know, you could do this to the day you die. Uh, so there's no uh, demand or no, no requirement to retire. In addition, if you look at the profitability of firms, um, if you were to, to, to sell and get your equity out, oftentimes it's very difficult to get that same return on investment by putting that into the market. Um, so there's a disincentive to sell, uh, although ultimately that can be damaging because then if you wait till death and you're forced to fire sale, you'll probably get far less for it. Um, but we've also got an issue with the lack of millennials, you know, adopting and moving into this industry. Um, it's funny because there's such, you know, there's so much talk about entrepreneurialism and technology um, being a big inspiration to millennials. That's what we're about, right? I mean, uh, most of us in this community are entrepreneurs. Uh, most of us in this community love technology and embrace technology and embrace change. This, to me, this industry is a perfect fit for millennials. So I'm surprised that we're not seeing the adoption rates that one would expect uh, per capita. Um, so that's, you know, like I said, not necessarily the the best one to, to close out on. Um, but it's good. Now, I, I sped up this conversation. I was hoping to have a little bit more time for Q&A at the end. Um, we've got one last poll question, but I do want to open it up um, uh, for um, uh, for any questions that you might have. Uh, do you plan to implement? Yes. Oh, actually, I apologize. I have a little bit more to go. I'm not done yet. I, I forgot that I got to tell you guys how to actually implement this. So hopefully I'm going to get that. So I'm, this poll question I'm not going to leave up for very long. So please, because i got six minutes left to cover how to actually take all this technology and implement it, um, which is such an important thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that while you guys actually answer this poll. Um, because I think that there you know, is a number of ways to, to implement this. But probably the, the most important thing that I could tell you is what I said in my panel with Method at QB Connect, uh, which is, you know, how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. You know, there's, we talked about a lot of great pieces of technology today. Don't go out and try and implement all 10 of these um, over the no next 2019, over, over 2019. Um, I encourage you to pick one, start, start with one, um, move on from there. Um, and depending upon the size of your business, uh, will determine how quickly you take your second bite because if you are, you know, a solopreneur, you can probably move very quickly um, because it's really just dependent on how quickly that you adapt um, and adopt new technology. And if you're a larger firm and, and the larger your firm, the longer it's going to take because now you need to get buy-in. Um, you need to make sure that your team is part of the decision of what technologies that you're implementing and embracing. Um, to make sure that they are all adopting and adapting to this technology 
Um, so making sure that that you're not moving on until the next one, until you have a reasonable percentage, a significant percentage of your team bought in and um, using and leveraging this technology before you take your, your second bite. So uh, I'm going to close out this poll now and share that. Um, so 70, 70 percent of you say, uh, yes, some of what was discussed. Good, because if uh, for the two percent who said all of all of what you discussed, I'm going to discourage you from doing that. Um, there's two percent of you who said I'm going to discuss. I'm going to implement all of what you discussed, and unless you already are implementing it, I want to strongly discourage you from trying to implement all ten of these over the course of the next year, because it will probably be extremely difficult. If you're a solopreneur, you might be able to do it, but if you are a team, to implement all of this in one year is probably going to be an overwhelming um, uh, obstacle. So, you know, to to sum up. Um, how do you actually go back and implement this change back in your practice? So make sure that you stay informed because this is where we sit today. Uh, technology is changing so rapidly and so quickly um, that it's really important to know and understand what's going on. So come out to these conferences, connect with these influencers, uh, be a part of these groups. Uh, most importantly, communicate with our community uh, to find out what's going on. Be willing to change. You know, so many of us, are tied into the way that we've always done things. I think it's it's natural human behavior to not like change. Uh, I, I'm the weird one here. It's, it's not you, it's me. I'm the weird one that likes change. Most of us, I think, are adverse to change, but you have to open yourself up. You have to be a little bit more uh, willing to, to change and you have to abandon your loyalty. And I, I mean like abandon your loyalty to the way that you've always done things because that's the way that you've always done things. Um, abandon your loyalty to traditional ways of thinking and open up your mind to new ways of thinking. Abandon your loyalty to um, what was your only source of information and open up your eyes to, new, to get new ways of gathering and information, whether that's on social media, whether that's in person, uh, whatever that might be. Um, abandon your loyalty to all the old paradigms and the old ways of thinking and recognize that there is a, a new world that is really exciting. It's a huge opportunity for those of us who are um, willing to, to risk it. Um, and I think that there was a great quote that I put out on Twitter the other day that came out of uh, Seth Godin's book, Tribes, which is a great book for anyone who, um, uh, looking for a good book to read. I'd say the two books, uh, I just finished Tribes by Seth Godin, uh, which I actually listened to for the second time. Um, and I'm right in the middle of Grit right now by Angela Duxworth. Two great reads. Um, but both of those really talk to this idea that um, if you want to be great, you got to be willing not to be. Um, what that means is if you want to be great, you have to be willing to take risks. You have to be willing to fall on your ass. And pardon my language there, but that's the truth is I am I have no problem falling on my ass. Um, and I think that that's the problem that we have in our industry is too many of us are afraid of falling down. And the only way that you learn and you grow is by falling on your butt and getting back up and trying trying new things. If you look to our children, I, I look to, to my children and all the children around us as great sources of inspiration because they walk through this world um, without any fear. You know, how do they learn to walk? They learn to walk by by falling down and falling over and trying new things. And, you know, it looks weird and it looks cumbersome and it looks awkward, but that's how you learn. And you have to be willing to be awkward and you have to be willing to fall down in order to be great. So I want to leave it at that. And, and I do encourage you guys, as I said earlier, to connect with me on social, uh, at WallCPA for Twitter and, and Instagram. Um, LinkedIn slash IN slash small business accountant for uh, uh, for LinkedIn and uh, on Facebook it's just Andrew Wall. So thank you guys for everything. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions, Corey. Maybe you can help me. I'll, I'll try to take a spin through and see if I can see what's going on here in the chat. Uh, Zennials, yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a new one for me. But I, of course, I didn't even talk about Gen X or Gen Y when we talked about that. Um, in terms of app bundles, does Andrew have any favorites that work well with who for payroll inventory or AP management? Um, you know, I'm probably not the best person to ask about app stacks. I have a very specific client base that I work with. So like my go-to app stack is like HubDoc uh, or Receipt Bank, maybe the occasional wage point 
10 T sheets, but not very complex things. My clients don't deal with inventory. Um, so don't deal with that very often. Um, I don't really deal with a, a lot of AP issues, but obviously like Pluto is, is a big one for AP. Um, uh, way pay, but I may not be the best person to ask of that that question, April. I get on those Facebook groups, um, you know, and post them there. You'll probably get better better answers to that question than I can give you. So hopefully, did uh, did everyone get some value out of this session? Oh, sorry, Corey. No, I was going to say, um, we've, uh, we've done a pretty good job of staying on top of the questions, so it doesn't look like there are uh, there are any more at this point in time. So uh, if there are any last minute ones, get them in. In the meantime, just kind of keep your calendars uh, ready. If you enjoyed this session or have found value in the other sessions that we've done, we still have more that are up and coming. The next one of these will be held on January 15th, again at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. This is going to be for anyone who has any cleanup work for clients. The title will be Tools and Tips for Client Cleanup Projects. So keep that in your calendar. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, get back in touch with us. Let's see. I did have one more poll that I forgot to do. <laughs> see if anyone's actually got a plan for how to implement this stuff. They're using change management strategies. Again, a little plug for, for uh, Melanie Schroeder, who I... I encourage people to reach out with about uh, she was the one who encouraged me to make sure that change management was a big part of this session um, so she's a big believer in change management and timing strategy for change management um, some of us I, I can see do have strategy for that most of us probably don't but I think building in a, a plan for change management is probably a good idea so again thank you Corey for giving me the opportunity today thank you Andrew for being with, with us so on that note, I don't think I there, – is there any other questions here? I don't think so, right? I'm probably going to sign off. If I miss anything, guys, tag me on social. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, April. Thank you, guys, for, for chatting and keeping this conversational. I appreciate it, even though you're not able to talk. Um, your feedback really means a lot to me. I, I like to see this. Uh, thanks, Brad. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. So we'll uh, close that poll and share it before I log off. Um, so I'm sharing that poll. Uh, looks like the majority do not have one, but it's pretty darn close to 50-50. Okay, bye for now, everybody. Thanks again for having me.